All right, listeners, you're listening to the Lament of Hope podcast, and I am here today with Suzanne Schindler. For those of you who listened to the previous episode, her well, a couple episodes ago, her brother Bobby Schindler was on talking about Terry Schiavo, which was the life and death case. It happened in the early 90s, and it ended early 2000s when Terry died. Um, but the interesting thing is, is this is still a very pertinent case now because we're running into life and death issues a lot, like Baby Indy when we had Dean Gregory on, I think it was last week. Um and it's just, it's a really good topic to discuss and to see and to talk about the effects of it upon family members, but also just getting the perspective of um, whether or not having something like euthanasia or having the idea of people being able, their life support being able to be taken from them um, is even something that we should look into more closely. Um, Suzanne, I want to ask you kind of to get started. Um, what was it like growing up with Terry? Cause I know, you know, when I listened to the lawless podcast, you mentioned a little bit about that, but would you be able to talk more about, um, like what was childhood like with you and Terry and Bobby growing up together? Um, my memories of our childhood are actually very good. We lived in a Kind of a nice normal neighborhood uh, on the outskirts of Philadelphia and we just had a a great upbringing uh very playful I remember just all of us playing outside all the time back in the days where it was safe to do that you know you leave in the afternoon and you don't come back till mom yells for dinner yeah so um we were outside a lot playing we had a lot of neighborhood kids and friends uh we had, grew up in a great school s- system um and we just it was kind of a normal upbringing. Um, Terry was five years older than me. So she had her own friends uh, and I wasn't, I was a little considered the baby sister growing up. So a lot of times I wasn't involved in that, but um, I just have a lot of fun memories. We took a lot of vacations as a family. We have visited um, grandparents all the time. Every Sunday we had my dad's mom, my grandma over for dinner. Uh, We went to church every Sunday. So it was just a nice, wholesome upbringing from what I can remember. Now, were you closer to Bobby or to Terry? Because if you're the youngest, maybe were you closer? Is Bobby, remind me, is he older than Terry or in the middle? So Bobby is only 13 months younger than Terry. So they were super close in age, uh, sort of called the Irish twins, so to speak. So I was four years younger than Bobby. So I would say they were closer together uh, than I was to either one of them just being the the kid sister so I was always like scratching to be close to them and play with them but they kind of did their own thing a lot so what were your passions as a kid what were you passionate about like hobbies or um I was athletic so I was in the okay. team sports softball soccer bass anything growing up that I could play I did Terry was not athletic she was more of the artist in the family I'm not sure if Bobby showed you some of her artwork or if you've seen it but no. she drew a lot uh she drew a lot of and mostly animals terry had an, a a wonderful affection for all kinds of animals she she loved loved them she but i remember like she wanted to grow up and be a vet at some point um you know when she was younger but so she drew a lot and she was more of like i said the art the art lover in the family I was more athletic so maybe that's we were a little bit different in that in that sense so when fast forward to the night that she collapsed when did you find out about that because I know Bobby came over and found her along with her husband at the time Mm -hmm. um but when did you kind of circle in on the scene and start getting involved as well so I got, I was at college, um, a few hours away from there, from St. Pete at the time. And I got a call in the middle of the night from my, uh, I think from my dad. So I told me that Terry was in the hospital and it was extremely serious. So I just hopped in the car and I raced, I raced home. So I was there once she got to the hospital, I was there in a couple of hours. So, so what did school look like for you? Because the, her condition lasted a long time. What did you, so, did you continue school after getting I, back or? 
I commuted for the rest of the semester to that college. It was uh, in Orlando. And then I finished up that semester there. And, and then I started uh, at USF in St. Pete, which is one of the main colleges in Florida, University of South Florida. And I, I was just a day student. Um, there was a campus close to home. So uh, I finished my degree over over time, just commuting to college. So I did I did finish though. How did it feel for you? Because Terry's condition lasted a long time, um, over a decade. And when did it, for you, did it ever kind of settle that this might be the way Terry would be for the rest of her life in the sense of um, not being able to communicate as she used to? Um, did that, uh, was that something that you were like, okay, this will, you know, eventually get better or she might get better? Or for you, is it more of um, just really coming to terms with the fact that she might, you know, need assistance, need to be in care for the rest of her life? Um, I would say absolutely that that thought entered my mind, of course. Um, but I always had hope for Terry early on because she was making improvements while she was in rehab. So uh, we had great hopes for her. Uh, I knew she was never going to be like the old Terry, but um, we obviously loved her just the same. But I did have high hopes for her improvement. We didn't know to what level she would improve, but she was making strides until she, Michael Shiva stopped all rehab. But uh, And then it just became a battle. So then we just were in a battle to keep Terry where she was and try and get her care. And it was just a nightmare from that point on. But um, I, I definitely knew she was not going to be the same. And it's interesting because a lot of news sources would claim that she was in a vegetative state, but even Bobby was sharing that during rehab, I mean, and even after, even when she was not in rehab, that was really far from the truth. Um, what kind of, when you say that you saw improvements or you saw um signs of just you know activity going on during rehab what were they um well she was in speech therapy so she was trying to talk uh and she was much more active when she was in therapy um more alert uh, you could just see she was tracking she was looking she was hearing uh things of that nature which was a great start from where she was in the beginning because she was, they didn't expect her to make it through the night. Cause she was in a coma for a while, right? She was. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, we thought she was making great improvements. Did you get to spend time with her when she was in rehab at all? Um, I mean, I, I would spend more, not more time with her when she wasn't in rehab when she was but yes, because she lived at home with my mom and my dad for a while and Michael. So, um, of course, I spent quite a bit of time with her during that time. How did it feel for you? Because she's so different from before. It became a way of life for us. Uh, it didn't, it just became, I don't want to say normal, but um, I didn't really give it a thought anymore. Just, it was just the way it was. Um, we just, she was the focus of the family. Uh, she was what we needed to, uh, um, to give all our energies to, uh, cause she was the one that needed us the most. So that was our, just our fan focus was on Terry for during that time. How was your relationship with Michael during that time? Well, you know, Michael and I never had a great relationship. Uh, I never, I was not, I never really got along with Michael very well. Uh, his personality and mine did not, did not connect. So I had a lot of trouble with him ever since day one. So okay. nothing, you know, then it was only, it was kind of worse as time went on, obviously, but Michael was very moody and just, not the nicest guy that you want to meet, but needless to say, he was her husband, so I had to accept that. And when you say your personalities were different, in what way? Because I, was it interests or just when you say he's moody? Is it because you're not like that at all? 
or no, he just was he he just was not a fun loving friendly kind of guy he was just okay. moody kind of quiet uh i didn't like the way he treated terry um he at uh, disrespectful at times just uh just not the nicest guy and terry was very different because she was very lively right and energetic. loving outgoing yeah. very close to her family yes so when it came down to the time when your dad asked about whether or not michael was going to restart her rehab as he claimed mm -hmm. he promised before and he came home and told you about the run-in he had had with um her husband i mean what was your reaction to that that he didn't want to do the rehab again that he was actually it seemed lashing out in anger despite the fact that there had been this idea that after he received a certain portion of the money um and remind me again where that money money came from um that was the lawsuit i believe right when he was um again they had, there was a lawsuit for her care because they believe that what happened to terry might have been the result of medical malpractice beforehand correct um, it was a malpractice suit so he was awarded over a million dollars for her care for the rest of her life. So we were ecstatic thinking Terry was going to get just a whole new level of care. Yeah. Um, and then uh, he stopped rehab. I, I remember just being confused and not understanding what was going on. I was very confused. So, uh, of course, it played out the way it did, why he stopped rehab. Everything started to kind of fall into place as to what his motives were, but um, didn't understand any of that in the beginning. And as soon as it became a legal battle, I mean, how did it feel for you that your family was fighting for Terry, her life, and mm -hmm. Bobby, I'm sorry, Michael, um, wasn't, but he was her husband, so even closer to home for her. I mean, how did that feel for you being involved in that, seeing that this man that, you know, had promised to care for her sure. wasn't doing that? It was very obviously very sad, but I I felt worse for my mom and dad. Of course, I felt bad for Terry because, you know, she she's helpless, and yeah. now he's going to abandon her, and now what's going to happen to her? But I, I mean, my parents that's their firstborn child. Um, I have a daughter. I can't imagine anybody doing that to my you know to my child. So I felt my parents were just devastated, as we all were. But you know, from a parent's perspective. That is, doesn't get much worse than that. So, but I honestly, I think once as a family, we felt like, all right, let's, let's put this in perspective. We're going to find an attorney and we'll just, we'll go to court and we'll get custody of Terry and everything will be fine. And I felt like that would happen. I never, it never occurred to me that the other would even be on the table. So at the time I remember being upset and confused, but I felt like, okay, we have an answer. We'll find someone to help us and then we'll just take custody of Terry and we'll, everything will be good. Didn't even consider the other, the other aspect. Didn't think it was even possible. And listeners, they did, there was a custody battle for a while, but Michael was ultimately given, well, he kept custody. And then after that, shortly after he, there became the question of not even keeping Terry on life support anymore. Um, during the legal battle, when your family was fighting, it became a fight to actually keep her life support on, and her tube was taken out so many times. Um, so, Danielle, can I stop you for one second, just for yeah, your listeners? Um, when you say life support, I think a lot of people feel uh, life support is more like a ventilator. So I think it's important to note that Terry was yes. just on food and water. Uh, when you say her tube, it was just her feeding tube. She was not on any other machines. She breathed fine on her own. She was living. She had, her heart was in great condition. Um, obviously she had a brain injury due to lack of oxygen to the brain. But the only thing that Tara relied on, just like all of us was food and water. So I just want to make that note for your listeners that she was not on what a lot of people understand to be life support as a ventilator or some type of machine. And the rehab it was mentioned even in the Lawless podcast um, by World that if with rehab, she might have actually been able to get rid of this feeding tube. 
Sure. She, a lot of people in Terry's condition are, are taught to eat again uh, on their own, like to be able to swallow solid foods and eat. So we just, we never had the opportunity to get Terry to that, to that state. She was starting rehab. That would have been um, part of rehab for her. It was just too soon. Uh, but she just didn't have the opportunity to learn how to eat again. So the feeding tube could have at some point been removed and she would have been fine uh, being able to sustain foods on her own, but we didn't get that far. So during this life and death battle to remove her feeding tube, and thank you for correcting me on the life support, um, what was daily life like for you? Because you had on the one hand, you had this case going on where your sister might die and then you're just living your life at the same time and then you're helping your family and at the same time I'm sure there's emotions about Michael still going on I mean what did daily life look like for you during that time well I mean at that point you know you're working there were lulls when nothing was happening you know a lot of times things take time in the courts when you're filing paperwork and so on so there were a lot of time where with lulls just taking care of Terry uh, but it was an ongoing battle with Michael. So I was, I, I had a lot of anger toward him for doing what he was doing. Cause I didn't understand it. And I kept, I just didn't understand why he was doing this to Terry or my mom and dad. Um, but you know, we were trying to have some sense of normalcy too. working. I had a daughter that I had to think about. She was in school. So we were trying to maintain some sense of normalcy yet. Uh, Terry was our priority. Did you get to see Terry? often during that time well it depends yes um as long as michael didn't because he he had the authority and the ability to remove us from visiting terry and he did that off and on uh just for random reasons because he could so there were times where we were uh taken off the visitor list um so when we could see her we would Obviously, my mom was there almost every day, but I was working and with my daughter, I was not there every day, but I was there as much as I could. Uh, but, you know, Michael did, Michael, he had, there were many times where we were blocked from seeing her. So we had to go to the court, go to the attorney and uh, file to get our visitation rights back. It was, it was just an ongoing battle for every step of the way with him. And did you get notified that your visitation rights were taken away or would you find out when you went there to visit? I feel like we found out when we went there to visit. Um, yeah, I don't remember. Like, it was a long time ago, so I'm just trying to remember how that all... I feel like at times when we went there, we were not allowed in. Did Do you think Terry knew what was going on at all? Ah, uh, that's hard to know. We did not tell her anything when we were visiting her about what was happening. We didn't want her to know what was going on. Uh, we uh, Visits with her, we tried to keep very light. We played music. My dad told jokes because she laughed at them. Um, and it was a we were always very loving to her. We did not tell her what was going on. We didn't want her to know. Um, so it's hard. To, I don't know what Michael would tell her i don't even know if he visited her so um we don't know when you say that she laughed at your dad's joke did you see her laughing oh yeah for sure terry would often laugh at my dad's jokes um she would when my mom came in the room she would light up like a christmas tree so and start talk she would just start like cr sometimes she would cry when she would hear my mom's voice so there was a lot going on there did you have any conversations with Terry during this time or try to talk to her? Of course. So, yeah, we always, we read to her, we talked to her. I would tell her all about my daughter, what was going on um, in the world, just report, you know, just try to keep her up with news, you know, just kind of normal conversations. We would just talk as a family in the room. We would, uh, we'd take her outside when we could, try to get her some fresh air. Uh, so... We just, we try to keep things normal for her, as normal as they could be. Uh, we try would to... she respond at all to when you were talking to her? Yeah, of course. She would, like I said, her her way of responding was either laughing or she would sometimes cry um, or make some noises and 
became like the norm for the way Terry would communicate. So we knew that was her trying to communicate. Did you ever ask Terry if she wanted to live when it came near the end, when it looked like, you know, the feeding tube was going to come out permanently? Mm -hmm. Did you ask her about we did. Like, what do you want? We did. And she did try to answer the question. Um, but I mean, they, uh, Michael Shivo and his group, his attorneys and whoever the doctors he had on his side didn't believe that Terry was responding purposely. So, so when you were, but when you saw it, what happened? Can you describe that for people? Um, I mean, she got animated and trying to, to talk, to say something when that question was asked. So she was trying very hard, uh, but in her own way, if she couldn't, she couldn't speak like we can, obviously. So um, it was difficult. What did it look like she was trying to say? Yes. That she yes. wanted to live? Of course, yes. Yeah, there's no way Terry would not want to have not wanted to live. That's that's not Terry. Terry was fun loving. She was very lighthearted. Um she was she didn't I I I chuckle. She didn't like to she didn't like any pain. She didn't like she was afraid of bees. She she just she would never ever have wanted her feeding tube removed. There's just no way. And yet Michael claimed she did. I know he did. He had to. In order to do what he did, he had to say that. How for, for you now, I know this is a long time later, you know, mm -hmm. more than a decade later, almost two now. Um, I mean, how do you feel towards Michael? Do you, have you forgiven him? Uh, I would say yes. Um, I don't have any anger toward Michael anymore. So, uh, over the years, you know, you know, you're either going to carry it with you or you're not. And I chose not to carry it with me. So, uh, Terry's death had a bigger purpose, uh, far beyond what maybe I can understand, but, um, he's insignificant to me anymore. Um, so no, I don't hold any, uh, any hard feelings toward him at all. When did you let that go? I don't know exactly when, sometime after her death. Uh, I, I I just, I didn't want to live the rest of my life carrying that anger and uh, all that, those hard feelings with me. So I wanted to just let it go and it, it happened and didn't want to, I don't want to relive it. I just wanted to let it happen. I mean, it happened and it's time to let it go and move on. Well, I was going to, it's curious to me how, because I know for me, if that had happened to my sister, because mm -hmm. um, I do have a sister, I don't know how I'd be able to do that. Um, because it's one thing to say, to let something go, but then it comes back or you might have a memory and it might be triggered and you might remember and then maybe you're upset again. Um, like how well, don't get you... me wrong. I I'm upset all the time. I mean, I, I have a lot of memories. I it, it's, it's here, but, um, I think there's a difference. I mean, that was a part of my, my life history, my family's history and, uh, the, but you, you have to look at the bigger picture sometimes. Um, and I felt like carrying all that anger around for Michael Shivo doesn't do me any good. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it just doesn't this it's not good mentally physically emotionally so i felt like i had to bury that anger uh with the whole with that whole part of my life um but there's still memories i still think about it uh it will it'll forever be a part of me um but you know i just i choose not to not to harbor resentment and anger toward him so that's my choice what did um what about god during this time 
Um, I know your brother, Bobby, when I spoke to him, it seems like he is pursuing a more vibrant religious life since what happened mm -hmm. to his sister. For you, I mean, how is your reaction to the idea of God with this? Because obviously Terry didn't live and she wasn't saved in the sense of, you know, her problems being taken away or what was unjust, what Michael did being punished in an earthly sense here. Um, I mean, how did you wrestle with that, with the idea of God? Because it seems like for your brother, it's something where he really wants to pursue it and seems to be at good terms with the idea of God. But how about for you? Well, I mean, there's a lot of bad things in the world and a lot of bad things happen to good people. Um, again, I, I, I really feel like Terry, Terry's case was, uh, was used. I want to say Terry was used, but, um, what happened to her has shed light on what's happening to people like Terry, uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think Terry's case has, has saved, when I say saved, I think a lot of people in Terry's condition, um, maybe have been saved because of her. So, you have to, I mean, I look at the good, there's so many good things that came from her case, from her death even. So, um, I, like, again, I feel like there was a, she held a bigger purpose. Maybe that's what she was here for. Um, and in that respect, I mean, I, I think that's, that's a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm proud of her for that. Uh, I think she's, everybody knows her name, most everybody. Um, so she's, I think she was, there's a reason why that happened. And that's all I can hold on to is that it's for other, for the betterment of other people like her. Now, do you have a relationship with the Lord, like your brother, Bobby? I, I can't answer that. Um, I don't, I don't know what his relationship is with the Lord or with God. Um, we don't really, I mean, we don't really talk about that. He and I, that's personal. And so it is for me too. So um, I i don't know how to, I, I can't answer like his relationship and my relationship. It just, um, I'm sure it's different. Obviously. When, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, and forgive me, it's more of, I think what I'm trying to get at, and I, I'm probably not phrasing it correctly. Um, is that several people that I have interviewed when tragedy strikes are angry at God. Mm -hmm. and I wondered if you experienced that emotion with your sister. You know, maybe there was a time where I was angry. Um, I don't know about, I mean, I, I've been, trust me, I've been through a gamut of emotions over the years, especially during, during it all, even from the moment of her collapse. But um, I don't know if I could say I was angry at God. I mean, I was just angry at what was happening. Yeah. So I, I can't say I blamed God or anybody else for it. I really blame Michael uh, yeah. for what was happening. And he was the reason why he's the reason why Terry died. I, I mean, he, he really should take the blame for it. He did it. Uh, so no, I don't think I blame God. I think I blame Michael for it. And I still what? do. Yeah. What was that last day like for you? I know you're with your brother when Terry's feeding tube had been removed. Was it 15 days? It was the 15th day when her feeding tube so. was out. Mm -hmm. um, what was that final day like being with her? Um, Probably one of the most difficult days of my life. The most difficult day. Um, it was ugly to see her in that state. Um, it was, it was a tough, I mean, it was horrible all the way around because my poor parents, I mean, everybody was going through it. Bobby and I were in the room and we were happy that my mom and dad were not in the room. Yeah. Um, but it, all I can say was at least we were with her, you know, to the end. So, uh, that's a good feeling to know that we were with her and during that time. What did she look like? Uh, I don't remember. 
because mm. I don't want to remember. Um, it was awful. I, I honestly, Danielle, I, I, I try not to go back there with the details of what she looked like. Cause I don't, I don't want to remember her like that. Yeah. Did she, do you, um, well, at that point she probably wasn't able to communicate much at all. Oh I'm no, guessing. no, there was yeah. no, she was, she was on, I mean, she was dying. There was, it was an, uh, it's an ugly process. Um, I don't know if you've done any research on what happens to people when they die from dehydration and yeah. starvation. I mean, it's a painful, uh, horrible uh, process. It's, it's not, it's inhumane. So. And when you were there, because I know you mentioned your parents, you were glad they weren't. Were you there? Was there a specific reason you wanted to be there to see her? Because I know it was hard and painful. But I think we were there. We didn't want, Bobby and I wanted to be there, sure. Uh, for We were hoping to be with her. We knew it was close, but we were hoping to be with her when she died because we didn't want him to be there. Um, Terry would have wanted her family with her, not Michael. So at least we got part of that we we did part of that for her being in the room with her but you know we got kicked out too so at the last second yeah that michael came and they you were kicked out and so you didn't get to see just like the final breath kind of thing well i kind of feel like we did but it's hard to know okay i mean we don't know for sure but i like to think that we were there for her final breath what makes you think that did you do you think you saw that or I do I do feel like we were there for her final breath but you know he'll they'll always say of course he said we weren't so it's it's hard to know I mean, you only know if you have to see yeah you know, we didn't we didn't put our hands on her because we weren't allowed yeah um, it was very policed I'm sure you knew all that so for when she died, when you found out that she had died, mm -hmm. was there a sense of relief at all in the fact that this had been going on for so long and whether or not she would die had been a question for so long? Was there any relief in a sense of like, okay, she's she's died, she's at peace in the sense that she doesn't, we don't have to keep doing this anymore? Or was it like just total grief for you where, you know, you wanted, you would have kept it going for as long as you could have um I think yes there was a ton of grief obviously um but you know she was suffering so much at that point that obviously we were glad she wasn't suffering anymore but it was just so needless it and that that we will always struggle with because it didn't Terry didn't have to die we could have easily taken her taken over yeah. custody cared for her so I still, that part of what, the why we can't, I still can't wrap my head around. So, um, because it, it just didn't need to happen. She didn't have to go through any of that yet. He made her go through all of that. And, you know, that's difficult still to this day to understand the why behind it. But again, um, you know, there, ha there's maybe reasons far beyond my earthly brain that can wrap my yeah. head around all of that. So I try to, again, walk away from that, those questions, because I don't have the answers to a lot of them. Um, and I can't carry, I just can't carry all that with me. It's, it's too painful. How did you process the grief afterwards with her passing? Cause you had all these news outlets and all these people wanting your attention. So your grief yeah. was public. It wasn't something private. Um, how did it, how did you process it during that time? Oh gosh, I don't even remember. I mean, you know, I was just trying to be strong for my parents and my daughter. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a young child. She was a you know, teen, little preteen. So I just try to be strong and, um, uh, you know, just not really sure like how I did it during the time, but, you know, you just kind of get through day by day. And then, you know, eventually, not too long after that, our focus shifted uh, to trying because we realized that this happens to people like Terry 
um, maybe under a little different circumstances, like, but people like her who can't feed themselves are often not cared for because they don't seem worthy and yeah. they consider in Florida, food and water is considered life support. So when they say uh, removing life support, um, food and water is considered life support. So hmm. sadly, uh, that's the case. So our, it's our interesting because uh, it's life support for everybody. <laughs> so. it, it is. I know. Everybody needs it. Um, but as a family, our focus shifted shortly thereafter. That's when we started the the, uh, the network. Did you, how did you explain it to your daughter? Did your daughter know what was going on? She, of course she did. She kind of, she lived it as well. Uh, she knew exactly what was happening all along the way. So, um, you know, we tried to keep her still, and she was in school. She had friends. I tried to keep some sense of normalcy for her. Didn't want to drag her through it all like we did, but she knew what was happening. How did you explain that as a mom? Because that's hard to explain to, you know, a young person, especially a child you cherish. How well, to explain I mean, to her that this is even a, a question now? She went through it from day one with all of us. So she knew what was going on. And I didn't really have to explain it to her because she knew what was happening. She knew what Michael was doing. Of course, she, just like all of us, didn't understand the why behind he was doing what he was doing. But um, she, she, she knew, was, she just was around it. It was, it became part of her life. Yeah. Like it was part of mine. So she, she knew what was happening. Uh, I, I, you know, we've, I've never actually asked her um, like what she thought of why it was going on. And I know. Yeah, you know, because it it was a painful time and it's something that I just don't like. I mean, I'm sitting here with you, obviously, because it's important, but I don't like to dredge all that up. I don't I don't bring it up with her. Yeah. I try. I just it. I don't. It's too painful for me to continue to talk about and question and live it and all that. So um, so I, I don't know. I don't know what she thought back then of but I knew she was living it with us. Do you see the world differently now than you did before, Terry? Before what I mean, I learned, I learned a lot. I think I learned a lot more about persons with disabilities because I never really had to before. So yeah. that opened up a whole new world uh, of the discrimination against people like Terry with brain injuries and the struggle that the families go through just to get proper care for their, their loved ones. Uh, I had no idea that people didn't get proper care and they didn't get the opportunity for rehabilitation. I just didn't, it never occurred to me because it didn't, I didn't need to think about all that. So um, I learned a ton about all of that and what families go through in the struggles. Do you feel that you're emotionally or you're like a different person since then? Um, I don't know I don't know how if if I'm different or not um I, I don't know how to answer that maybe um so I don't know I'm sure it changes you um you know going through such a tragic I think tragedy changes everybody yeah. when it hits close to home so um I, you know I also we're not the only family that's gone through tragedy with their I mean, people lose loved ones all the time in tragic ways. Ours just was public, um, yeah. which true. Um, we, we didn't want that. I mean, we never wanted all that spotlight. We just wanted to take Terry home and get her the rehab she deserves. So, but it, you know, we had to go through it just because it, it was what it was. So have you had an opportunity since then to be able to maybe in some ways encourage or minister to other people in your life who've lost a loved one or who have a loved one who has a disability or a special need? Has that helped you of being able to talk about it more with others, being able to encourage them or have sure. empathy? Yeah, of course. I mean, I've got direct experience with it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, there's much, I have much greater empathy for anybody uh, that's a caregiver for uh, persons with disabilities or even that 
have empathy for the people who have a disability. I definitely have a, a different perspective. What, just as a final question, what, how do you think you would, just encouraging listeners now, because you're right that this is a topic that isn't gone away. In fact, I think it, in many ways it's it's coming more, whether not in the spotlight of news per se, it's coming up more even just, I think, in smaller, you know, news articles or whatever, but you're hearing more stories about um, either the government saying, you know, this this person, like with in the case of Baby Indy, it was, you know, medical officials who said, you know, it, it's not worth it for her to get more treatment. Um, so it's best that she just pass away, you know, her life support be taken away. Um and this is just a case in a lot of things. Even my grandfather went through something similar in Canada where it's just, you know, he was too old and it didn't seem like there was a reason for him to keep going. Um, why do you think that this is an important issue and a topic and how would you encourage people to know more about it? Um, so I, I think, I mean, encouraging people to know more about it. The sad thing about that is I don't think people think about it until it happens either to them or hits close to home. It's just not something people think about. I mean, who thinks about euthanasia uh, or that sort of thing? I, I, it's, it's not a common day-to-day -day, um, conversation. Uh, so I just think it's one of those things that people learn about it, um, either if they are working in that type of field, uh, whether it's working with people with disabilities or in the medical profession, mm -hmm. or it happens to someone that you love, or it happens to yourself, um, I don't know. It even after Terry's case, like Bobby and I actually talk about it. It just this goes on all the time. It just does. And we were kind of we thought perhaps her case would and for a while, you know, it shed a lot of light on this happening to people like Terry, but it still happens. Um I don't think there's a change in that sadly. Yeah. Mhm. Mm uh, yeah it's, it's hard to explain, you know, this topic is not a hot button for most people unless it hits home. It's not like abortion where that is just a hot, obviously it's a big issue and people get behind it because, you know, the, they just do for the pro-life movement or they, because they, um, but this sort of thing, it, I don't know, maybe because it's hard to, I don't know. I mean, I don't know why more people are outraged at um, at what goes on for persons like Terry or like your grandfather. Uh, it just, it just does. It's, yeah. it's an uphill battle, frankly, uh, yeah. just to, to get people um, behind that issue. It just, it's, it's very difficult. Um. Well, again, listeners, you're listening to Suzanne Schindler, and um, it's interesting what she said, unless it hits close to home, you know, people don't really think about it. And that's true, because to be honest, until, you know, it hit home for me uh, a few years ago, and also, honestly, listening to Terry's story, which mm -hmm. was really impactful, um, I, I really didn't think about it. So I do encourage you listeners, if you, you're interested, really do listen. The Lawless podcast was really helpful for me in giving a lot of the details and the background information. Um, but also just listening to interviews with Bobby and his sister and the network that they have. Um, they post a lot of stories in on the Facebook page about people who have been, who have received rehabilitation or actually grown, mm -hmm. even though the medical professionals thought that they wouldn't at all. Um, so, but again, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Suzanne. It happens all the time. Yeah. So, but any, you know, Suzanne, I, I do appreciate it and I'm sorry. I know this is painful. So I appreciate that you even took the time to talk about it again. 
No problem, Danielle. Was, uh, thank you for uh, for having the discussion and keeping it keeping it relevant.